I just started the stream with the drawing and the drone. Hello everybody, welcome, 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 welcome from all around the world. See if I can rattle everybody off who's here. Uh, John from Charleston, Ohio. Arthur from West Richland, Washington. Casey, Lisa from NEFL, I think that's Northeast Florida. Sarah Bradford from Pittsburgh. Geister from Georgia, Virginia. Frank from Portugal. Uh, Frank's fiddle. I don't know where Frank is. Uh, Peggy Link, Carolyn from Wales, Cosimo Volsa. Are you from Italy, Cosima? Terry from Albuquerque, David from Kentucky, Tom from Oliver, British Columbia, Bob from Wyoming. They keep coming in. This is cool. Richard from Utah, Mary from New York City, the city, the big city, John from Salt Lake City. Uh, Christopher from Alfred, New York. Peggy from New Jersey. Jim, good to see you. Moon Shadows. You guys see uh, James Gwyn? Gin? Gwyn, I think. He's, he's the one, if you've been following Fiddlehead and you read that America Fiddles article on the early days of fiddling, that's Jim for you folks. Say he hello to him. Rodney Stogner from Louisiana. Kristen from Colorado. I think I've got your question, Kristen. Um, 
get to it hopefully david brown from vermont owen from mechanicsville virginia owen good to see you long time supporter um if i miss your name please forgive me uh because it chat window jumps around a little bit hank hank boss from the netherlands one of my favorite cities on earth second favorite city is amsterdam and then i love the netherlands bettina from san francisco hey bettina nancy brown oh we already said hi to you <laughs> um a marnik kathy from oregon another longtime supporter thanks kathy gail from scotland all right i think that's good tara all right, Cecilia, Ginny. Okay, so I'm gonna just do a few quick housekeeping type announcements and then just jump into the questions, uh, trying out a new strategy of having people email questions in advance because then I could kind of do a little outline and then with time left over doing like a speed round of questions at the end. So thanks for everybody for saying where you're from and hopefully you can all connect somehow and I, I have sort of a, well, I've, I'll save that question for later. Um, but, well, I guess now, now is an appropriate time. So there's all these people from around the world and something, I want to plant a seed in your head. Would you like, are any of you interested in getting together with other students, either Fiddlehead or otherwise on Zoom to kind of have student groups? It's something that I'd like to explore because it might help you guys to practice and stay motivated and you su ideas you support each other. So just uh, if you feel like that's something you're interested in, forming a Zoom group with students, um, just planting the seed and leave your thoughts in this chat. If, if you're interested in that, just let me know right now in a comment and then I'm going to keep rolling with some other announcements. Um, the other thing I want to announce, and it'll be in the next newsletter, is that I'm gonna give away some private lessons. Uh, just they're gonna be really short, like a half an hour private lesson. I think I'm gonna give away like four to six lessons. So there'll be more winners in this giveaway than in past giveaways. The last giveaway I did was a, a fiddle made by Michael uh, Reeve, I think is his last name. And he, uh, um, anyway, that was only one. So we only had one winner. This time we'll have six winners and and uh, the idea is it's it's less of a it's more of a lesson for feedback it'll be short like a half an hour 25 minutes actually and it, it's just a way for you to get some quick feedback so stay tuned for that lesson giveaway and if the whole idea works out i might have somebody else help me to tutor you guys all right so that'll be part it's part of partly also an experiment because I think that's the thing that lacks most from the Fiddlehead site currently is that a lot of you are kind of playing on your own and could use a little one-on-one -on -one feedback. All right. So, and finally, uh, something I want to improve upon that I realized after getting this office hours announced is that I want to make it really clear that we're making, we're, a lot of the questions that I answer here end up in a page called micro lessons on the site. And I'll put a link to that. But, I, but the point is, is that as they build up, when I want, I'm going to try to make it really clear that you, know, you may find your answer there before asking it in an office hours question. Uh, that said, there are a few du sort of duplicates today, and if, if I have time, I'm going to get to them because sometimes if I answer the question in a slightly different way, then that helps people understand it they have that aha moment when they hear it explained so even though i've done it already it might help help you out so for those of you who attended a lot of these and you hear the same question i apologize but it's all for the greater good of fiddling in the world okay so um that said and and thanks for everybody who's leaving zoom comments i see a lot of yeses and um and i'll be asking you more maybe in a survey for more details uh, to help figure this out this whole thing and but anyway I'm just gonna I'm not gonna really read them carefully now and a lot of the comments I'm gonna kind of ignore just for the moment um, unless they pertain to the question I'm answering so I'm gonna start with the question from Kelly in Syracuse New York and thank you for your question so she she asked me when you say to practice something a thousand times, do you actually track it? If so, how? That's a good question. And 
for those of you who follow the site, you know, like I have this thing I say a lot, which I got from Earl Scruggs, repeat a thousand times. But actually people have kind of right, rightfully so criticized me on that because like what you, you just, what if you're playing it wrong a thousand times? Is that good? And that's a great point. You know, if you're going to be playing something a thousand times, the idea is that it's not just a mechanical thing that you're just checking off, you know, a hundred times a day or something. The idea is, is that you practice that thing in a lot of different ways. You really tap into your creativity to practice it. So if you're practicing um, like a string changing thing, like um, I'm working on an Orange Blossom special lesson. So if you're practicing that, you have to do it a thousand times in order to get it but maybe you you explore different ways to practice it like maybe you practice just the bowing without fingering and then maybe you try to do the bowing with more double stop feel and so and then maybe you do it on different strings so in and, and in addition to like the creative practice you want to be asking yourself what's working, what's not. In other words, you want to pay attention. You, so you're not just mechanically doing something a thousand times. You're paying attention to, okay, what's hard here? Oh, it's that, oh, it's maybe when I, when I try to add fingerings to the Orange Blossom special. That's really hard to play in tune. Okay, so now how can I just practice the fingerings? So then you break it down and do that. So, so anyway, when I say repeat a thousand times, it means you're going to play it, whatever it is, a whole lot, but you're going to be learning from it. You're not just kind of blindly doing it. Hopefully that makes sense. And then the second part of Kelly's question is, do you actually do you track it? And if so, how? So be honest, Kelly, I've only tracked it once and I don't even remember what it was for, but I think... I was learning something like a couple years ago, maybe like two years ago, and I just resolved to practice it, like to get to a thousand. And I and basically what you can do, there's sort of you can just do a little math to figure out. Well, if I do it 50 times a day, then that equals about 20 days. Is that right? Yeah. So, so 50 times a day. If it's a tune, that's going to be a lot. That's going to be maybe too much. So you maybe you need more time, but. A lot of the repeat a thousand times, um, helicopter alert. That's a sign. That's a sign that we're in Los Angeles. Lots of helicopters. Okay. Um, so. So yeah. So you could track it, and if you really were into it, and, and if anybody's interested in doing this, I'm just going to lay out a little plan and let me know how it goes. Uh, it may not be ultimately necessary, but the idea is the idea is basically you play something every day for like 10 minutes uh, for like a three week period. And then you've roughly done it a thousand times if it's if it's, you know, like the Orange Blossom special. So maybe I'll, I'll practice it like 10 reps in different ways, 10 times now, then I'll take a break. I'll do something else. Maybe I'll go and play a scale and go back to the Orange Blossom Special. And then maybe uh, I'll do a tune like She Begs She More, the opening tune. And back to the Orange Blossom Special. And you eventually get to that 50 times a day for that little thing. And, and that means in, in roughly 20 days, you've done it a thousand times. So it's, yeah, again, it's easier with a little piece uh, and with a tune, you could do it a thousand times. It may just take you a longer time, but you know, just be patient and just keep returning to it and paying attention to it. So uh, let me see, I had a few other notes on that. Um, yeah, so this works better. Oh yeah, here's the last thing. So that, I wanna to touch upon that idea of like playing something a little bit doing something different, going back to the first thing, something different, is a new term, kind of practice term that I'm teaching and talking about called interleaving. 
And anybody can do this, the most beginner student, most advanced student. So if you're a beginner, you can go between just bowing on open strings and maybe plucking little things. And then back to open strings. So you see that way your brain, when you switch gears, you're still working on that other skill and it's just kind of giving it a little time off. And then the most advanced players, you know, like somebody doing Orange Blossom Special or vibrato or playing in higher positions, you do a little bit of that and then you switch to your piece and you go back. And this back and forth is called interleaving. Okay, so uh, I think that about answers that question. And so lo long story short, if you do want to play, play a small little thing a thousand times, if you do it for about 10 minutes a day, for about three weeks, you're gonna get there. And by a small thing, I mean like a little two bar exercise. And with the tune, I haven't done the math on it, but you could, you know, if you play it like five times a day, then, you know, you wanna do it a thousand times, that's 200 days, but you could do it. I mean, you know, like just have a long view, like maybe it takes you a year, but you, it's not like you're only doing that tune, you know, you do other tunes, but if you keep playing Kerfunk and Jig or something over the span of a year, you're gonna, you probably play it a thousand times. All right, so cool. A little long-winded, so I'm gonna move on. Next question, this is from AB in San Diego. Nice man who sent me an email about, he likes to drink coffee, I think, in the morning with Fiddlehead, so appreciate that. And so he asks, how do you make finger double stops sound good? And a lot of these questions I've sort of paraphrased, paraphrased, paraphrased into a more simple question. What he originally said was, I'm trying to learn double stops while playing on two strings. I'm okay with D and A strings if the stops are on A. So I think he means that he's fingering the A. And, and then he says, but if, if he's playing the notes on the D string, that the fingers touch the A string and it, it doesn't sound good. Okay, so let's go into that. So uh, basically, so what he's talking about is here are the D and the A strings. And when you're placing a finger on the A, it's easier. But when you're on the D, what's happening is that, the, say you're using your index or first finger, it's slightly touching the A string. And so there's a few strategies you can use to overcome that. The first is try to play on the tips. Getting used to this camera setup. So try to play on the tip versus flat. The more you're on the tip, the less real estate your finger takes up and the less it'll touch. The next tip is to lean, is to play more, like cheat over towards the G string. So if I wanna play D1 and open A, which sounds like this. I would cheat pretty far over to the G string. All right, and that, that way I make room for the A. All right, and then here's, here's an exercise, and there's a lot of these type of exercises to help prepare for double stops with fingers. The essential exercise though is to hold down the finger and not play a double stop, but to break it up. My first music teacher's name was Joyce Osborne and she called this the stunt, which you hold down a finger on one string, just holding down a finger while you play other things. And you can do it with other fingers, D2 to A. And this is how it prepares you. If you can do this cleanly, then now listen to the double stop. But if you can't do that separated, the separated notes cleanly, that means you either got to move away from the A string or adjust the angle so that you come down more on the tip. All right. So that's roughly the answer for that. I, I have another, I answered this question, I think two months ago, and I might combine uh, on the micro lessons page when this comes up, whenever it does, I'll probably combine, have both videos up to help you guys. All right. So let's move on. Uh, and um, okay. So, and uh, let me know if I'm going too fast. I'm gonna check, what I think I should do 
is check in after I um, do a question and see if there are any follow-up questions. So I don't see any on the double stops thing. And if there are, then I'll, I'll try to get to them later. Um, okay, here we have one. Franksville, real problem for us fellows with thick fingers. Just thinking about quitting on double stops. Uh, okay, so I think that one of the greatest violin players in the world, Itzhak Perlman, has relatively thick fingers, Frank. So I think you can do it. Uh, I would, I would start by, I would start, I would just really work at placing your first finger as far away from that A as possible, so that you you can really feel the G string, and with with work and adjusting the angle, I think you can do it. And if you still have trouble, uh, let me know. Okay. Um, okay. So moving on. Uh, Tara from North Carolina, thanks for your question. It's another double stops question. She asks, regarding double stops, how do you know when to use them? Should they be played throughout the entire tune or should I sp sprinkle them in when they feel right? When I listen to other fiddle players like Ian Walsh, Mark Connor, or yourself, it seems like you guys play the entire tune with double stops or you're picking and choosing when to play them. So that's a good question. And the simple answer is, it's up to you and finding your own voice. So there, there's a lot of different ways you can play a fiddle tune. And what I like to do is alternate between using double stops and not, especially if you're playing it multiple times. So a tune like She Begs, She More that we started with, you know, I, I tend to like to start really simply. without without double stops and then and then use double stops as a flavor later all right but there's also ways that you can integrate double stops in and single stops with little rhythms and to, to create kind of alternating textures so for instance there you could you could ma you could kind of practice I, I call this sort of single double exercises like and then then doing that you could integrate like double stops as accents so like so I'll do that super slow that's whiskey f before breakfast Double, single, single, double, single, single, double, single, single. All right? So you see how that works? If you get really good at this alternation of single and double stops on an open string, then you can start to do it in other tunes. You know, in jigs too, like... So I'm doing a... Double, single, double, single, single, double, single, single, double, single, single, all right? All right, so, yeah, but ultimately, you want to, in order to know what's right, there's no, you know, what, what sounds good and what sounds good to you. You could start listening a lot to fiddlers you like and try to envision kind of where you'd like to go. But then also listen to yourself and ask yourself what's working. And maybe you just do a little bit of double stops, you know, just do the ones that sound good, you know, so, or maybe certain, just don't, st don't do it on very complex tunes at first. Like, I'd like to get people learning double stops on very simple tunes like Fado Do, -Do or Cajun Waltz. And then just droning open A. And then finally, you could alternate between with double stops and without. And another way to look at it, alternating between a basic version and a variation version. So simple, basic. Doubles. 
and then after going back and forth, you may decide, well, I can do double stops on just the long notes. So kind of a, maybe a bit of a wishy-washy answer, but you, you just start integrating a little bit and start seeing what sounds good, what's a challenge, and, and just keep playing with it. But just know that there's no right way to add double stops. Sometimes the best thing is just to play a simple, clean melody. Okay, so cool. Thanks, Tara, for your question. Um, moving on. Okay, okay. So what was, I had another thing I was going to ask you guys. Or maybe I'll ask you at the end. Well, I was going to ask everybody just to just to check in. This is a totally off the topic of everything we've done, but it's a practice question. And my question to all of you is: Have you been? How has the lockdown and the quarantine affected your fiddle practice? Have you been practicing more or less? Also, has it changed since the lockdown began? So we began in March. Were you practicing more or less then than you are now? So, so I'm gonna kind of move on to the next question, and but I just wanted to hear what you guys said about think about that. Um, Forty hours, Kim Harris says. Wow, you're a pro professional. Every day, that's good. More time to practice, says Lisa. I have more time and feel more relaxed to do it, says Sarah. Okay, good. Sounds like everybody's practicing a bit more. Tammy, practicing less, I lost the belief in myself. Okay, Tammy, well, I think it's, a, it's such a, I hear what you're saying and I think that success, this is a very unique way of looking at success, Tammy, with, with music. It's simply doing it every day. If you play every day, then that is success in itself. That, and, and you just nurture that, and eventually it, it'll sound a little bit better. There's a lot more to this point, but if you just establish and do it every day and make that your goal, then you succeed. You can do every time you pick it up, you succeed. And if it's not perfect, you still have done well by practicing that day. And I'm, it almost always works out that when people take this philosophy, they end up improving the way they practice and improving their sound. So I hope that helps, Tammy. All right. Okay, well, it's good to hear that everybody's playing a lot. Okay, it's great. You guys are playing more than me, to be honest. I spend too much time on the computer. I, I'm, and then I end up practicing at like 11 at night, but it's still fun. All right, so I'm going to move on. Thank you all for, uh, and if I missed your comment, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at these later and it'll affect how I speak to you the next time. All right. Steph. Uh, she did, Steph didn't say where she's from. She asks, how can I avoid shoulder and back pain when practicing? So this is a good question too. It's something that I've been thinking about more and more and something I'd like to teach more and more. But basically pay attention to your body is the short answer. And be kind to your body in some way if you can. Um, and I have a few tips to help with that. A very basic tip is to take breaks. Maybe practice in 20 minute chunks. Practice for 20 minutes, actually set down the fiddle, breathe. A lot of times breathing can relax the body, stretch. There's all kinds of stretches that I'll do. I'll do this, I'll bend, I'll bend down and touch my toes a few times, bend to the side, and or maybe just walk around. It's, it's just a way to be kind to your body. But by doing that, you kind of, what happens is, is that People get so into learn, trying to do something, they're thinking so hard that they totally tune out from their body and their body is suffering and then, and then a little bit later, it's tense and they, they're like, oh, what happened? It's not until the body sends a pain signal that you're like, oh, geez, I need to change something. So, 
And I'm, I'm answering this question for myself as much as you. It's something that I am working on and that I'd like to develop some sort of system or a way of really integrating like almost like fiddle yoga or musician yoga where you kind of return to your breath, return to your body throughout a practice session. All right. So anyhow, I, do I have any other ideas? Oh yeah. And then for shoulder and back pain, I recommend a really good shoulder rest. This is Bon Musica. And uh, I'll, when I, I'm going to do notes for, for these office hours, as you know, as some of you may know, and index, indexed questions, further notes, and I'll, I'll put a link to this. But this is like the, a super high-tech shoulder rest that makes it a lot easier to use. There's other uh, devices that I haven't tried that I want to get just so they understand how they work. There's something called like Wonder Thumb, which works for the left hand and it's supposed to relax the left hand. And then there's uh, something I think um, for the bow hand that you can use to kind of get the bow. All these things I think are great tools because a lot of you are learning on your own. You don't have the benefit of direct feedback from a teacher and, and any tool you can use to kind of get the position right, I think is not a pretty good idea. Uh, so so anyway, to how, to redu how to avoid the back pain, shoulder pain, take breaks, stretch, breathe, and, and have a good shoulder rest. Okay, thanks for your question, Steph. Moving on. Lisa from Northeast Florida asked, how do you go about implementing the various shuffles into songs without losing the melodic line? Okay, so I think what you mean by that, Lisa, correct me if I'm wrong, I, thought, I think I saw you there, is um, there's, there's different, like I teach something called the Georgia Shuffle. You can also do just sort of an offbeat accent. Or just a swing. So how do you integrate that into a line? I will say that you start with just getting that thing really solid in, on a very small piece, if it, it may be even an open string, like so swing bowing, which is a form of shuffle, depending on how you define it. But I think shuffle kind of just means a triplet kind of feel, but in a 4 4 tune, like. Sorry, I got distracted by Sarah says, going back to the previous question, with your shoulders, periodically check to see if your shoulders are down and relaxed as you play. That's a good point because uh, a lot of time there's there's a lot of and basically again pay attention to your body. If if you're doing anything that's yeah, you want to relax it. Say so, you know how minimal energy can you use? Okay. Okay, so sorry, back to the current question. So, so basically you try to integrate, the, you, you try to just get that shuffle bowing on a simple little piece, maybe four notes. So like, let's do the Georgia shuffle on just four notes. And the more you master something there, and then on a scale, then this will start to translate to tunes. And this applies to all kinds of stuff, you know, not just this Georgia Shuffle. This is just a practice strategy that I talk about a lot. But, you know, you, scales are your friends. And these little exercises can be your friends. They're little, little pieces of music that allow you to test and practice things. So, but what, how do you actually get it into a song is what you really want to do. So you would start with some little piece from a song. So let's go to Arkansas Traveler again. The first four notes. 
Actually, I think we better do the first um, bar. So I first started without any bowing. And then now I'm going to... Maybe I need to slow it down to really get that. Then you start to feel comfortable with adding it to that one little bit. And it's going to be a bit painstaking at first. You know, while you're learning this, you're not going to automatically be able to do it to all tunes right away. It's going to be a, a bit of a process, but it's fun though, because you'll, you actually get the experience of like, whoa, I'm really learning a lot as I go. Um, and slowly speed it up. You want to get to the point where anything you do, and this goes back to the question of the body again, is somewhat casual and relaxed. You know, it's like, you think, no big deal. But when we learn hard new things, it's just like, oh, we're gonna push and just get it. And then that kind of energy get, actually gets in the way. So the more you can just be like, eh, I'm just making music, let's give it a try. And then you could do the next piece. Maybe you just need to do one little. And then you slowly do it. Then you put together the first two bars. All right. And so, so the, just to sum up this answer, we, you can practice the, any, anything, but we're asking, we're talking about shuffle bowing on one little bit, then on a scale, and then, and then just little bits of tunes and then piece together the full tune from that. And sometimes what'll happen is you get one little, this might happen the more you've done this practice, but say you've done this shuffle practice a lot and you get it on one little piece, you'll suddenly have it on the whole thing. That's like a thing that'll happen down the line with practices. You'll be like, oh, I see how this tune works. I can get it, all right? So, okay. So thanks, Lisa, for your question. Gonna move on. So. Let's see if there's any follow-up here. Scales are your friends. Um, I think I did, Tara, I think I defined shuffle bowing, and, but and I'm actually not sure this is right, what, what all other fiddlers would say, but the shuffle is sort of like a, think of triplets. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. But then what, the basic shuffle idea is we we kind of length we kind of take the first two notes of the triplet and make a long short long short long and that's kind of like a swing feel that's the shuffle feel and so so that's how I'm going to define shuffle for today if anybody has a better definition just let me know um, but that's always how I how I thought of it. Okay, so cool. Um, the next question. So this is a question that three of you asked in that survey of like that I sent out asking for you know kind of asking you for you, the thing you wanted to know most. So Joe from Los Angeles, Anita from Mulberry, Tennessee, and Richard from Utah all want to know how often do I need to use rosin on my bow? Can there be too much rosin? All right. So, in a nutshell, uh, I, I put on rosin maybe twice a week. I looked it up and, on some violin maintenance sites and I read that it's every four to six hours is one opinion. I just tend to, I don't like to overdo it, but the second par part of your question is can I put too much on and it's really not going to hurt it too much. The only thing that happens is you put too much on, you're going to see a lot of dust caking the fiddle. And, you, you know, that's, that's the main... Some, some fiddlers like to keep that on. When I was in Ireland, there's one amazing Irish fiddler, an, an older gentleman who just had like a, a wide circle of rosin dust. I, I tend to keep mine mostly clean, I, you know, so... Um, but yeah, so I'll put it on maybe twice a, a week 
and that's it uh yeah and what other uh what other yeah and if you have too little so this is a key point if you have too little then you'll when you play it you it won't the bow won't catch i'm trying to trying to like emulate that all right so anyhow hopefully that answers the rosin question and and then let's see i use just in case you're wondering i use hinder sign rosin and but i'm interested in exploring some other rosin maybe maybe that'll change the sound in some way so okay cool thanks for that question everybody and then anita um who asked that question had a, had another question that i'm going to answer right now which is how do i know if i've tightened the bow hair enough and so this is another maintenance type question so this is about how tight i have it as you can see the bow is still sort of curved this way Maybe you can't see it, but you'll know that it's too tight if it starts to look like an archery bow and the bow is bowing out like that. And then you'll know it's not tight enough. So this is like it completely loose. When you play, the hair gets pressed down. So I tend to have it somewhat on the loose side, at least compared to like a classical player. I think a classical player would make it a little tighter. Um, and that's that. That's how to tighten the bow. So thanks for your two questions, Anita, and every, the other people too. All right. So moving on to another maintenance type question. Ginny from Colorado asks, do I need to use a humidifier for my violin? She says further, I use a tube type humidifier that slides into my violin. I can't tell if it's working. How can you tell? Do you think these those work well? So the honest answer I have is I don't know. I have not used one or haven't been in, an, in a, an environment where I've really needed that. But I did look it up and um, in, the, in the office hours notes, I'll include a video I found and then links to something, a product called Damp It, which is just, it just, I'm not exactly sure how it works, but it basically releases a little moisture into the case um, or it, you can put it you can actually have one in the case you can have one that fits the damp it actually goes into the instrument and it, it just sort of naturally balances the level of humidity for your fiddle so yeah that would be useful like if you lived in a desert type environment you might want that unless you already had like a humidifier for your house and then you could just leave the fiddle out but yeah, so if so, that would be something to look at. And maybe in a very dry environment, if you do get the damp it thing, I'm just thinking out loud, you may want to actually put the violin away, close it so that it really protects the violin more. So I, I tend to leave my violin out and, and kind of coach people to do that because then it's easier to practice. It's just there. You don't have to set something up. But if you live in an extremely dry environment, you may need to do that and then and then I also thought I would I would mention what if you live in the opposite place like New Orleans or somewhere with really high humidity like what do you do like that and that could actually cause damage too is what I, what I learned and there's one guy I found who I'll include a video but I think his name is like Olaf the fiddle maker Olaf the violin maker and was, he's actually kind of a fun personality he uh, he takes a pillowcase irons it and, and puts it on the fiddle and then puts it away and then that helps to draw you know out the moisture and, and protect the fiddle so more maintenance questions but see I would have never wondered that on my own and so thank you uh, uh, thank you Jenny for the question because uh, I, I didn't know that now I kind of know it if I'm ever somewhere where I need that I'm prepared so yeah if I ever find myself in Guatemala I'll be sure to bring an iron Okay, moving on. Um, Mary in West Georgia. All right, let's see. When should I slur the bow, she asks. I'm curious about when to use the slur. For example, midnight on the water, on the eighth notes, can I use the slur? I have confusion about when the slur is useful. So that's a good question. And it's related to some other things I've said 
but um, basically you want to try to experiment a lot so there's there's no absolute right way to fiddle something you want it to sound good is really the just the guiding principle how can you make it sound the best if you if you're gonna be adding slurs and it's gonna really mess it up for you then just let it go for now wait till you're better at slurs practice your slurs a lot on the scales like there's a whole bunch of slur exercises I've made like slur 2 slur 4 slur 8 uh, slur 2 separate 2 which is kind of can be trans and then Georgia shuffle to practice all of those but then Again, it's a process of experimentation. So you're asking about Midnight on the Water. So yeah, there's a lot of ways you can do this. So here are the eighth notes. Let me do it again. So then you would you would kind of use your practice microscope, go in on that part and say like, well, how do I want to do that? I actually have music up. I'm gonna take a look at it. Where was it? Here it is. So I think on the fiddlehead side, I bow it like this. So here's a disclaimer about bowing. Though, though I have some bowings on the site, some slur markings, I almost never do it the same way twice. So for better or for worse, that's, I think probably a lot of fiddlers maybe have tendencies, but they, they're very, with fiddling you tend to be a little bit more flexible and it, you, when you reinvent the song, each time you play it, you might do it a little differently. But I would say like, yeah, start, to, start with something simple so, so maybe it's just start with like, maybe it's slur just two notes, the open A to one, and do that a few times. If that starts to be comfortable, see if you can do more, maybe. So I did slurred four at the end there. So, I mean, this is really gets to the core, like, philosophy of, like, how we make music with the fiddle. You're experimenting, and you're trying to find different ways to do it, and you're kind of learning, but also expressing yourself at the same time by doing it these different ways. So another way to look at it is, like, fiddling is an art, and it's a practice. Like, as you practice different ways to slur something, maybe slur all those eighth notes together, then you do it maybe with slur two. And so these variations are also the art because it makes it, it makes the art more interesting and beautiful when it's a little different every time. So I hope, I hope that makes sense that, that fiddling is like a practice, you're doing things different ways, you're trying to get better, but then th that those variations you add are also an art form. So. So any other, let me see, I've had any other notes for that. Yeah, the, the last note is just something I said earlier with, with uh, I think, the double stops question, is that there's sort of a, a practice path that you can use over and over for everything. And that's to start with the simplest possible piece, so maybe just slurring two. Then, then maybe slur two on a scale. And then once you master that on maybe another scale, then then try to do a little piece of the tune in question, you know, so maybe just and, and experiment with that and then expand out to a bigger piece. You know, so you kind of once you figure out how you want to do that little piece, you integrate it into the piece that's parts surrounding it, what comes before and what comes after. And 
do this, do that a bunch. I'm gonna just, just in case you want to know, the, what I settled on there finally was. So I do one big, I think, slurring six together. Then slur to slur three. Again, it's just experimentation. I've gotten faster at it because I've done it a lot. It'll probably, if you're new to this type of thing, you'll just have to, I would just do one little thing and that'll be, that'll help you. Okay, um, so we're almost done, um, at least with the questions that were submitted. Uh, the last one is Nancy from Kentucky. She says, how can I improve my fast playing? I'm working on Little Liza Jean. When I get to 5.45 on the play long track, it becomes too fast. So, okay, before I answer that question, I have a question that popped in my head about the fiddlehead play along tracks. So, for those of you who have used the site, you know that the play along tracks speed up gradually. So here's my last question to you guys. Do you like that? Do you like it some of the time? Or do you wish you didn't have that? Do you wish the play along tracks were one speed? So kind of a big question and I'm not sure if I could, it would take me a while to change it from what it is, but I'm just curious if for going forward and making new play along tracks, would you want to have it done a different way? Would you want to have a single tempo? So something to think about. And I might ask you again, if you don't feel like answering now, I might ask again in a survey within a week or two. All right, so now getting back to Nancy's question about how can I improve my fast playing? So the first thing I, I like to really respond with is why do you want to play fast? Oh, she wanted to play fast because the play along track does. But ultimately, you know, what, what, where are you going with that? Do you want to play with others? Okay, so if that's your goal and that's why you want to play fast, it's good to know. And, but basically, if you're a beginner, I don't think it's good to rush to that point of playing fast because it will limit you down the line. In fact, if you get really solid with just fundamentals, and what's more important than playing fast is playing it in time. That's what another thing I want to explore with a series of lessons is just timing. And... I'll just go over that really quick, a little detour from the playing fast question, but you really want to work on timing first. So use, like say you're practicing, use a metronome some of the time. I don't recommend all the time, but some of the time just play with the metronome like and, and do very simple things with the metronome because using it is a lot harder than you think. Usually when people use metronomes for the first time, they're like, well, the thing is speeding up. And then they're like, no, now it's slowing down. It's very like psychedelic because you're so used to playing on your own, you, don't, you lose track of the time. So I, I recommend, if you wanna play fast, the first step is just tighten up your tempo uh, on very mid tempos. Don't do things too slow or too fast, all right? So do it on scales or single notes even with a metronome, just to get in the groove. Let your body really hear it. Make the metronome nice and loud so you can really, it's just, you can really groove with it, okay? So, and then there's lots of different exercises you can do, but basically you follow a similar practice path. You would do a metronome with open note, open strings, then with scales, then simple tunes, And then, and then maybe harder tunes after that. Okay, so but now let's talk about playing fast. How do you get to the point where you play fast? Well, first off, I would identify the parts in the song that are really hard. So I don't have a pencil handy, but here's some here's some music, and maybe um. So maybe this part of the song of Midnight on the Water. It's really hard for you. You could put a pencil bracket around the parts that are hard. That's another good reason why reading sheet music can be helpful is it can help you practice. Got a lesson coming on that soon, but how you can use sheet music to actually help you work on hard parts. 
So, but okay, so you were trying to play fast. You pick out those spots where you really slow down. You may need to record or use a metronome to know those spots, but then you, you know. So then you say, okay, that's what I need to speed up. Then you speed up the very hardest parts to, and you find out what that fastest tempo is. So maybe it's 70 beats per minute for the very hardest part. And then you know that 70 is your fastest tempo right now. So basically, we, you're always trying to look at what's holding me back from playing faster work on those little parts and then go and try to do the whole thing at that speed and slowly every incrementally make something sound faster now the play along tracks on fiddlehead jump and jump and jump and for a lot of you it might not be possible to really do the fastest tempo all right then i'm gonna now i'm gonna talk about the jedi knight method to playing things faster and that's to play things extremely slow with a metronome and this is hard too it's much harder than playing a mid tempo so like you would you would start with like so i forgot to do the metronome sound but uh so yeah um Anyhow, hopefully that makes sense. So the, the, to sum up, the, the few tips are focus on the hard parts of a tune. Um, and, and before that, even focus on your timing, then on the hardest parts of a tune in order to fat, speed it up, and then try to play the same thing very slow, all right? And that will, and, and, and then finally, I just should close this question by saying, be patient. And don't worry too much about playing fast. Just don't worry about it yet. It's way more important for you to get your fundamentals down and, and that will allow you to play faster eventually, all right? That all said, it's fun to push yourself and go ahead and push yourself a little bit, but the more fundamental work you do at an even speed, the better. Because then you're giving your hands need so much time to learn this and they just need to do these. And if you're going too fast, your hands aren't learning anything. Your arms aren't learning. If you're, if you're always, if you're, you know, like this, I can tell when people are playing too fast. They're like, you can tell that their fingers are lagging. Like, or maybe their bow changes are lagging. Like, and it's because they're just, it's just too quick. You know, if you notice either of those two things, that little carryover, it should be a signal to you to slow it down a little bit. It doesn't have to be extreme. All right. Take a breath and slow it down. Okay, so that's the end of all these questions. I don't have as much time for extra questions today, unfortunately. I'll do a f I'll take a few, but um, if so, if any of you have any extra little questions, I might do another five to ten minutes. Okay, and if not, uh, and just in case any of you need to drop out because it's almost one. Thank you all for watching, and always a good time. To be, this is a, I love I think I always have a good time during these office hours because um, it's so stressful to set the whole thing up technically and then once it's all set up and running I'm like oh, okay this is great this is fun uh, Jason has more midi chlorians than Master Yoda oh gosh you don't want that you don't want to say things like that Kim because it'll go to my head and then I'll lose all my midi chlorians Master Yoda is a very humble master. All right, um, Lisa, can I ask about signing up? Sure, let me know what question you have, Lisa. And I'll take other, any other little questions. Lisa says, I can't even get Twinkle Twinkle to sound with a metronome using a pendulum metronome. So Lisa, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star is too hard to start with a metronome. You wanna start with single notes, okay? You don't start with a tune on the metronome, you start with a It's harder than you think, even if you're already playing advanced tunes. And in fact, like if you're a total beginner, I wouldn't even bother with the metronome right away, to be honest. Like if you've only been playing a month, like hold off on it. It's just going to be too frustrating. You, as a beginner, you want to focus on your sound and your, 
you you just want to just get the sound and the the coordination you know like the metronome is just going to be just another layer of stress for you metronomes for once you're established and you're ready to take your playing to the next level okay I see any other questions how do you remember how do you remember to do all things at once I just went a whole week with my elbow wrong again it's a good question Kim Kim Harris uh, there's a lot to remember for all you compassion to all you beginners out there it, it's frustrating you you you, you Think about you. You're trying to do your left hand finger, and then your bow goes goes crazy, goes down. You know here, or your shoulder gets. And so it's it's just a process of scanning through each part of what the process, separating things out, putting them together. So so Kim, you would con I would constantly ha ask you if you were, were doing an in person lesson, just be like, okay, take a break from working on that tune and just bow. And look at your elbow. Okay, good. Now go back to the tune you were working on. Let's say you were learning O oh, Susanna. And then then take a break after and up oh, look where my elbow is. And just bring it back and do open strings. The elbow is pretty good. Do a simple scale. Something where you don't have to think too hard about. All right, and, and then just be kind to yourself. It, it'll take a while to break certain habits, okay? So, but you you basically, I said this earlier about like breaks, you know, you're constantly taking breaks, checking in with your body, checking in with different things, and separating out your task is the main thing, all right? You know, like if any of you have played piano, sometimes you just do the left hand, sometimes you just do the right hand, then you put together both on one little, one bar maybe one little phrase and the same thing goes for all these technical things like if you're really struggling with the left hand set down the bow and just do the left hand that's why plucking is so good and then you're like okay starting to get the left hand I'll try to add back the bow maybe on open strings and then let's try to do plucking and bowing it's still a struggle then I go back to just plucking so it, it takes a little bit of patience but it, it can be really satisfying to keep returning to the elements you know element of left hand fingering the element of bowing the element of relaxing the body and then do it all over again and there are a lot of other elements remembering the melody is one remembering to play in time you know there's a lot to remember and so that's why we just kind of keep coming back to those fundamental elements, practicing them on their own. Uh, okay, thanks for your question, Kim. Uh, I think that might be it. Much Going to work on double stops now, says Joanne. All right. I used to hate the metronome, says Vera, but I love to learn to love it, especially for learning new things. Good for you, Vera. Uh, I, liked, I like the metronome, and I, I, I still need it. Um, Okay, let's see. One Cold Canuck. Love your name. <laughs> I have a subscription that I should be a bit more diligent at using. All right, One Cold Canuck. Uh, my response to you, One Cold Canuck, just want to keep saying your name, is uh, just play. One, one thing I learned recently is to get more consistent practice is the two-minute rule. You say to yourself, I'm going to practice two minutes a day. And then when you say that, you're, and you commit to two minutes a day, you're like, I can do that. Of course, of course if you can do more, if you pick it up, you, you'll probably end up doing more. But whenever there's always that mental resistance to practicing. And with, with you have the two-minute rule, you'll be like, oh, it's only two minutes. I could do that. So you pick it up, and then, you, and then you, it makes a way, it will help you a lot to play every day. I'm really starting to teach that more and encourage my students to take that approach for the ones who are having trouble practicing. As, as we saw earlier in, in the feed when I asked you guys how you're doing with practicing during lockdown, some of you are like, oh, I'm playing two hours a day. They don't need the two minute rule. But for those of you who are struggling, and it's a real struggle and I sometimes like don't always have the, I, I need to use it too sometimes. So, um, Anyhow, 
All right, all right. So I think that's it. Uh, thanks, everybody. And um, stay tuned for the index of questions. I'm not sure when it'll come up, but within a week or so, you'll see that. And, and I'll see you next time. Thank you all. Bye.